to episode 14 of Arsenal Pass, Time of the Round. Today, we're joined by Stephen Kukas. Stephen is the man behind the popular YouTube channel, DM Armada. He recently commentated the biggest competitive tournament in flesh and blood history at the Calling Las Vegas. I've known Stephen for about a year, and his advice has been instrumental in making Arsenal Pass what it is today. Anyway, Stephen, how are you doing? I'm good, dude. I'm fantastic. I just want to say that I count it um, very... I just find this a very distinct pleasure to hang out with you guys because i think you guys make some of literally the best flesh and blood content out there and uh i watch a ton of it and i absolutely love it and mm -hmm. i push people your way because it is it is a fantastic uh channel that you guys are putting on and some fantastic content that i think is criminally underrated if not just outright the best so you guys are awesome and i'm glad to be here you yeah, definitely appreciate that and there's a yeah. there's a phrase i like to use which is we stand on the shoulders of giants. So someone had to pave the way um, and that you were undoubtedly a part of that process. So we well, appreciate, I appreciate that, but I am <laughs> short. So yeah, everything, somebody, someone else got to be somebody else. Everything that you've, you've kind of done for the game, getting in early and raising awareness and just kind of being that like marquee channel that, you know, players can come into and it's recognizable. is just really good for the game. Um, and I'm really happy with like, as a collective where we've pushed content creation in the past year, um, as kind of YouTube, I don't know what you would call it, producers, content creators, whatever it is. <clears throat> I really, I'm really happy with kind of where we are right now. And I think that the future is very, very bright. Um, oh, I agree. I, think, I yeah, totally we, agree. We definitely owe a lot to a lot of you guys that started early, specifically yourself, Red Zone Rogue. Um, and of course the taco man, <laughs> not really content creator, but you know, he's not, he, his, uh, you know, it, Bringing the game on was just huge for us, and I I'm really appreciate it. Anyway, Stephen, I got to talk to you about, uh, like, sp just give me your kind of calling experience. Like, obviously, we talk about you know, the flesh, the Las Vegas calling being the most important and kind of historic event so far, mm -hmm. something that will go down in history. What was your experience like? And also, what was it like to commentate that? I mean, it's just such sure. a monumentous event. So to be the kind of the front man, it's a pretty big deal. Yeah, it was. So my experience in a very personal level was, I'm sure, very distinct to a lot of people, because for me, it um, it was incredibly exciting to be at that kind of an event. And I don't go to a ton of just giant events when it comes to like card games or anything like that. So for me, it was incredibly exciting. And one of those things that like, obviously, everyone marks their calendar for something like that. But even more so for me, because it was one of those huge events that I don't often get to go to or haven't in the past. Uh, but for me, it was also a little strange because um, I was, I guess, in a way, it was like a work trip. You know, I viewed it from that scenario, because my goal going to the calling was one to play in the premiere event, because that was going to be incredible. And so I checked that off the list early. And then after I did that, I was like, I'm probably not going to get to play another game of flesh and blood. But what I am going to get to do is hopefully help people around the world get to watch some good games of flesh and blood. So for me, it was it was definitely a different and distinct experience because I went to it knowing that once Friday was done, it was all about trying to give everybody that was watching, um, you know, just like an enjoyable or more informative experience uh, from the commentator's perspective. And it's kind of a kind of a weird position to be in, but one that I really enjoyed. I, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And as you said, it was um the up until now you know it's like the the premier flesh and blood event as far as like population uh notoriety um it's it's right up there with the the callings that have had we've had in the past um you know overseas uh but as far as attendees and that sort of thing this was like the number one and so it was incredibly humbling to both get asked to and then to uh, have the opportunity to go and uh, actually provide commentary and i hope the people that got to watch it or that, uh, you know, watched it after the fact got something out of the stuff that we were talking about. So, yeah, well, I, I was I was sat at home, Stephen, watching it and I thought you did, you know, first of all, a fantastic job. So well done. I, I wanted to ask, I had to ask, have you have you done casting in the past? Is this the first first time for you, Stephen? Yeah. So I started my YouTube channel like six years ago doing commentary over gameplay. 
and I did that for like two years straight. So I provided commentary over gameplay that I played um, for just two years. That was that was my sort of content schedule. It was like I go to a game store, I sit down with a webcam and my computer, I record the games. I played like four or five in a in a row with with some friends, and then I would go home. I would edit the videos so I'd take out all the pauses and then I would just provide commentary over the top of that. And that would be my sort of upload kind of schedule. So I did that uh, for a good long chunk of time. And then I provided commentary for, um, and I did that for, by the way, a game called Dice Masters, which I then proceeded to do the uh, the world's commentary for. So wow. they had like a world championship uh, in 2019, literally two months, no, maybe one month before Flesh and Blood dropped. Uh, I went to, um, where was it held? It was held in like Arkansas or something like that. And uh, we went and provided commentary for the world championships. And it was a lot of the same sort of feeling of like, okay, we're going to you know do the content. We're going to provide commentary. We'll do some cutaways and, and discuss what we saw and what we're going to see. Cut to a break, come back, that sort of thing. So for me, the experience felt very familiar and and pretty comfortable overall and i really just credit that to having the opportunity to do that and the prior experience that i did in commentating were you nervous at all though were you nervous round one you sat down you were in the booth for round one how are you feeling <laughs> i was surprisingly not nervous i will no. tell you this i was more nervous um trying to make my flight in the morning on friday and then trying to make the flight on Sunday after the tournament wrapped than I was actually providing commentary. And I hope that doesn't come across as like, oh, look at this guy. He's just <laughs> so good at commentary. But for me, it was like, I just like doing that. And so it, it's been a long time since I've provided commentary on a video. Mm -hmm. So I was really excited to get to do that again because it's kind of where I started YouTube in the first place. And it was a lot of fun to revisit in a lot of ways. Awesome. Yeah, the uh, the old Friday fr come in Friday, leave Sunday is a tight schedule on in Vegas. So yeah, I don't envy that. But you know, you made it. You, you got it done. I wanna I wanna kind of pull it back a little bit. How did you kind of first hear about Flesh and Blood, and how did you, you know, get into the game? Sure. So um, Flesh and Blood here in the U.S. launched officially like October. What do you guys think? 20, 23rd or something like that? It was like October, late October. Right? Yeah, October, yeah. September, around that time. And I was literally just like scrolling on my phone about two weeks prior to the actual launch of the game. And I passed an ad on Facebook. And I guess Legend Story Studios thought, you know what we're going to do? We're going to put ads on Facebook and target all of those people scrolling on Facebook. And it worked on me because I <laughs> scrolled past a picture of Dorinthia, like the hero art Dorinthia. Mm -hmm. Um, and I and I scrolled past it because I was just scrolling and then it caught me. So I scrolled back up and I was like, that's good art. I want to know what this is. And I clicked it and I realized it was a card game and it took me to the website and it was like, this card game is based in New Zealand. What a weird thing. And then I saw that they were going to have a tournament and give away some prize money in Austin after the game launched. And I was like, whoa, this is audacious. In a lot of ways, it's like, look at this. These this this company is dropping a card game and they're hosting like two different tournaments. One in I think it was New Jersey and then one in New Austin, Jersey, Austin, and obviously yeah. uh, Sydney and New Zealand, I think was the right. circuit. Mm -hmm. And I was just I was like, this is crazy. Like what a what an audacious thing to do. I have to know more about this. I have to take a look at this. And so um I looked on their website and found that they were selling some product or they were going to sell some product at Reaper Game Store in Denton. So when the <laughs> day dropped, literally, I left school and drove to Reaper Game Store and bought like, I think, two hero decks and like six packs. And I came home and I opened them on camera. And as I opened them and kind of like just saw and experienced the cards and like the art, the aesthetic, I was like, this is awesome. And so it was just from there, I kind of ran with it. Yeah, the old Reaper game store. I was the same place where I started as well. Um, yeah. Guy over there who runs it. You probably heard it. A lot of people probably heard him before. It's Bill. It's a good guy. He's you know, huge into flesh and blood nowadays. So really happy yeah. for him. And that's just it's an awesome store. But yeah, super cool. I, I didn't know they ran Facebook ads. As someone who does that for a living, it's uh it's I can't imagine how janky they must have been. Just targeting people like yourself who you know, <laughs> like a bunch of TCG stuff on Facebook, surely. But yeah, that, yeah. that first circuit was really interesting. Um, I think it was successful 
to an extent in Sydney and New Zealand. And I, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously the U S was a, a bit funky. We've talked about this a little bit on the pod before, but New Jersey was pretty small. And then obviously Austin was uh, pretty small too, just being slightly over 30 players, I believe like yeah. under 40. Um, and like, you know, they had committed to, t- to $10,000 is the prize pool. Yeah. Um, which is funny, but it, the way it played out too is everybody back then. By the way, if anybody doesn't know, everybody in top eight got a got a gold tunic. So if you sat on that, you made a lot more than ten thousand dollars. <laughs> I still regret not going. I was coming home from San Antonio the weekend that ran, and uh, I got home and I was like, okay, if I leave now, I could get down <laughs> there and I could play in the tournament. And I was like, that would be fun. It'd be a lot of fun. In fact, I even I think I even wrote them and I was like. Hey, would it be possible for me to bring my laptop and like record or stream some of the of the calling? And uh, I can't remember if I actually sent that or if I just chickened out and didn't actually send that message. But eventually, I was like, "No, nah, I'm tired. I shouldn't go down there." If I would have known, I, I mean, this is true of like all <laughs> flesh and blood. If you would have only known, right? And if you could have only done well at that event, then like, what kind of crazy things you'd see even more, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, old like <laughs> if I knew, if I knew last week's lottery numbers, you know. Mm, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I remember walking in there on the uh, on the Friday of and seeing Sasha Markovic and James White trying to set up the posters. The uh the store is actually it was funny. Um decent game store, but it was a janky tournament. Uh they like didn't yeah. have table numbers, they didn't have judge, of course, and it was just crazy. I remember when I went to sign up for the event, um this was on Friday, so this is the day before, and I was just like paying for my ticket. The person who I went up to, you know, to do it with that the cashier didn't even know what the game was they're like uh, i don't mm. think we have that i was like i think you do <laughs> <laughs> please tell me i'm in the right spot it's a little funny a little, little bit different i know in sydney they had like they hired out a venue so um mm. maybe a little bit a little bit more on the the ball but that's the exciting thing about day one of a game right as you get in at the the ground level and you have all these uh these stories to tell afterwards so you know yeah. it's, i'm glad that you picked up those packs Stephen, and i uh, haven't looked back since and just been doing your thing oh and and super credit to lss too because um i i opened those packs and i kind of figured out how the game worked and um then i went back and i think i bought more packs or something like that and lss uh they saw that i was opening packs on like a stream and literally like lss dev members got on the stream and were like talking about like hey have you opened the cold foil yet and like this and that and then they like reached out and like sent a box just straight up sent a box of welcome to wraith alpha and like some some hero decks or no some um some welcome decks uh to me and it was like kudos to them for making such an amazing first impression as a company because after that i was like yeah i not only do I like this game, but I like the people behind it and I want them to succeed. Yeah, I think I can I can tell a story like that, too. Uh, I don't know how private it is, but I think it's OK to share it. Um, I remember. Oh, oh, here we go, everybody. <laughs> Write it it's, down. It's not spicy at all. But uh, so back in Crucible, um, there had been some issues with like card quality. And I actually had a really rare one, which was um, like the glue had leaked on to the back of my like crater fist. I sent it in and got a fix and all that stuff. But I remember when we sent it in, like uh, my partner and I, we like sent a picture like with our dog and like a little Polaroid and stuff. Um, and then when Christmas came around, um, I'm a big limited player. Obviously I played in the calling. That's when I met uh, James White was at that Austin calling. And I've always just been a big, big fan of limited, big proponent. And so was my partner. And I remember for Christmas, they actually sent us, um, like 12 packs of welcome to Wraith with like a handwritten letter. And that's the that's stuff where awesome. it's just like, you know, it's just so far above and beyond that you're mm. just like, what? And it, it's just incredible. Mm. Yeah. That's awesome. What a gift, man. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, it, was, it was so good. And I've, I've, I, when I traveled over there, um, James was super, super nice. He like picked me up from my, uh, you know, from the place I was staying, my Airbnb, and went and drove me, you know, took me out to lunch, and then drove me up to the game store to play in the, uh, like, a uh, armory. It was just, like, it's just the most surreal cool. experience. Yeah, just super, super awesome guy. Um, anyway, I want to get into Tales of Aria, because obviously that's that's on everyone's mind. Um, we're going to keep it super basic, though. I just want to hear what excites you the most about Tales of Aria. We'll start with you, Steven. Uh, what excites me the most? That's a good question. Um, hmm. I like the idea of, to, I think, I like the idea of a self-contained set in the sense that it, it, it really makes it, anyone that wants to sit down to it 
think about how you specifically want to build that hero. And to me, like a hero centric game like Flesh and Blood, this is the kind of set that kind of drives that point home uh, in a lot of ways. And I, I didn't think I would like that as much as, as I do now. Um, the idea that like, yes, there are generics in the sense that like cards that can be branched from elemental to like classic, like for example, um, I have some on my desk, Seek and Destroy. It's a great ranger card that uh, you could play in regular ranger like Azalea or uh, in elemental ranger, right? Or Sting of Sorcery that you could play in uh, any rune blade ever that you'd like to play in. But the idea that the set itself is predominantly about those three characters or those three heroes and how you want to go about building them is really interesting to me. And not only is it really good for like limited play in the sense that like all these heroes are very interchangeable, but the idea that you can take two elements and cross them over and overlap their card pools within the set is really fascinating from a deck building perspective. And so for me, I think I'm most excited to take that uh, sort of self-contained set and just build every possible iteration of a deck or of a, I guess of a character, you know what I mean? like. Earth Oldham, Ice Oldham, Earth Briar, uh, Lightning Briar, that sort of thing. I think that's what I'm most excited about. Hayden, what about yourself? Um, I mean, I massively agree on that, Stephen. It's something that we've talked about on, I think, the pod as well, and even maybe time around with with um, Taylor. Like the idea that I think it's so bold that LSS go, you know what, here's a set that's so self-contained that we might be potentially alienating, you know, ninja players, for instance, or, yeah. or whatever it might be, is just like a really bold step. But the, I guess they're so confident in, first of all, how this gameplay, uh, or how the set plays for limited, which is, is huge. And to be honest, that's the thing that I'm mm-hmm. most excited about for Tales of Aria is the limited, or at least that's what yeah. I have been most excited about as it's released, is what this will do for the next limited set. We really missed out on like a Monarch limited season for the most part. Um, mm-hmm. We didn't really get an Arcane Rising limited um season which i'm probably okay with but yeah i'm really excited with with tales of aria to have this this limited um, format you know over your side of the world you guys get uh, three callings three limited callings um it's just yeah it's gonna be super exciting i think and just to see how probably the other thing as well is how this plays out differently so like to your point Stephen, right being a self-contained set you go and you look at monarch and it introduce mechanics and introduce the talent system and then all of a sudden mm-hmm. tales comes along and we're in the world of aria and it's uh there's you know there's it's still the same game and it's still some similarities but there's so many differences and so many unique things to the set that when we come around to the next set uh, it's gonna be different again so yeah just yeah i think it's such a cool thing that's being done with these sets and how they live uh live by themselves brendan yeah that's yeah, really cool um <laughs> no i think i think like i totally agree with you um but I'll just get a little spicy, you know, just talk about, I'll I'll zoom in a bit. So for me, I'm like, uh, I'm pretty excited about New Horizon, um, or is it New Horizons, plural. The Ranger equipment had just the idea, like double arsenal, I think, uh, really throws a wrench in kind of the equation, right? And what you can do with that and how you can maybe abuse that to do, you know, things that weren't possible in the game for four. I'm very, very interested. So uh, it's kind of fresh on my mind because I opened a new horizon today. Um, <laughs> so I'm just interested to see what that does to, you know, obviously Lexi, you've kind of gotten a cursory glance at what the lightning deck looks like um, in that, but also in Azalea, like what could that look like? Um, and what cards mm-hmm. are, you know, very powerful when you have double arsenal slots. Yeah. Is that your best pool, by the way, Brendan? Is that my best pool? No, I opened. Leading uh, <laughs> uh, question. Yeah. So by about, the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So about twenty minutes before I got on here, I opened uh, the Corsham, so the Fable, which is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I honestly, I, 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 me and Stephen were talking about it before. He's like, I kind of didn't believe the Fables existed anymore because <laughs> I'd gone so long without opening one. Um, I know not- I kind of notoriously opened five cases of Crucible of War, um, first edition, and got zero legendaries and zero Fables. So that was a. Yeah, I got that bad luck out of me. It's it's gone. So yeah, haven't haven't opened one since Welcome to Wraith, which I the Cold Flow Heart that I did open was at the calling and it was at a sealed deck opening for the battle heart and, and James is right next to me and man, I opened it. I knew it was a rare card, but I was like, yeah, I was like, whatever. Like it's a rare card. Like I've opened rare cards before in like magic and like draft or whatever. And James just lost his shit like he was freaking out he was you so don't pumped. understand <laughs> yeah he was so pumped and like he was like he's like take a picture of him and he just, all this and i was like oh okay yeah yeah and um 
yeah, I'm happy up in that one. But it's cool to see court like the Corsham is really, really cool. Is it confirmed that the um the unlimited one is gonna have different text? Or is it I don't know. I don't know if it's confirmed. I don't know. But okay, I mean, yeah, because it's a rumor then. Okay, got it. There's yeah. there's so many things. This is the cool thing, right? You now you not only do you speculate <laughs> on first edition, you speculate like what's the differences in unlimited? Like presumably channel like yeah. uh, you know, like frigid won't have the altar, you know, we won't get this right. and that, but it's such a they might be some they might be something different, right? Like we saw with one like unlimited, so no, it's a cool. It's a cool. What about you, Stephen? What's your best best pool so far from your your cases? I know you've opened a couple. I've only opened a single box. Oh, and it single wasn't box. fantastic. Okay, all right, um, all right. Well, it wasn't fan. My best pull. Wait for it. Is this foil seek and destroy? I know it's impressive, nice. but you watch out. It's gonna do some work. It's not bad. That's 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 all I <laughs> got. Job. I'm gonna open more. I'm gonna open more tomorrow. Um, and then I have I have some stuff in the mail that hopefully that'll come in and uh, I'll crack a bunch more and nice. maybe we'll get maybe we'll get luckier than we did in Monarch. I had some uh, less than stellar Monarch pulls, so crossing my fingers that that kind of luck turns. Yeah, so did I. Monarch was Monarch was a little bit rough on me. Uh, the one thing that did work out for me in Monarch is that I opened like all of almost. All except for one cold foil equipment and somehow got zero dupe. Uh, sorry, not the legendary ones, the common mm. ones, but didn't get oh. any duplicates in Monarch, which was like, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I got all your, I got all your cold foil common duplicates. Oh, I got all this. <laughs> a so. bunch of like Ironhide chests, just cold foils. Mm. Racking I'll just, them up. I'll just I may have quiet. gotten, I may have gotten <laughs> like six or seven iron hides. Would you get hate? Just a bunch of, a bunch of gas. Uh, I mean, from from the current set uh, from Tales, I've I have been lucky enough to open a big foily tree uh, and oh, yeah. some some nice legendaries. Um, but Monarch is why I did also wow. pull a library, although it was unlimited. But I did I did pull a library, so you know, mm -hmm. I'm very very lucky, very fortunate. You cracked like four the... cases, right, Hayden? Four cases, yeah, of Tales. Yeah. Wow. That's I am awesome. the worst puller amongst us. <laughs> So I have far. never opened. I've never opened a cold foil ledge or a cold foil uh, majest. No, cold foil fable. Why? Why couldn't I say that? I've never opened a cold foil fable. I've never held a cold foil fable. Ooh. They do exist, probably, do. but I can't confirm it. I don't know. You say they do. I had one in my hands yesterday, I, or twelve hours ago. I had one in my hands. So <laughs> anyway. So Stephen, I want to ask you, um, what do you see as your future in Flesh and Blood? Is has I don't know. Has it become more than you expected it? I mean, obviously, I think it's, you know, whenever all of us kind of jump into something in the very early stages, we don't really expect it to become this. Like it's very, you know, very impressive how far we've come. But you know, where where we are now, how do you kind of see the future of like DM Armada, and then also the future of Stephen Cook as in Flesh and Blood? That's a super deep question. I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> Hold on. Give me like five minutes of introspection <laughs> and I can come back to that question. No, I'm a very, in, in general, I'm a very introspective person. And so that is like a, that's a tough one for me, but you came ready uh, for it. I can thinking. spitball here. I'll spitball for it. Um, future of DM Armada uh, is, I guess, continuing to create flesh and blood content the way that I enjoy doing it. I think for me, um, this has always been a creative outlet. And I think first and foremost, uh, it's, it's always been one of those things that like, I do this because I enjoy it. And I do it because I like, uh, making things that people enjoy or learn or, you know, get some value out of, um, like I get life from that. So for me, no matter, I guess, really what happens, I'm, I'm set in my ways of trying to create something content wise or, I guess providing commentary in some way, shape, or form uh, that people get value out of, because that's that's really how I get the life from it. And so hopefully people appreciate that going forward. So I guess that's that's where I'm sort of aiming for in a very large scale DM Armada fashion. And I think I fit kind of alongside of that as well. It's it's hard to for me. It's hard to separate like the me and the DM Armada, because it literally is just me making videos. Like I'll sit down, I'll record something, I will edit it and then I'll put it up there. So in a lot of ways, I don't really view like the channel and me separately. Um, of course, like this is not talking about my family, you know, and that sort of stuff, but uh, my marriage and all that. But uh, as far as me and the channel is concerned, I oftentimes just view that as just me so in a lot of ways i think just my goal is to 
make things that people find value or get get life out of and in doing so i uh, i enjoy the experience alongside of that so hopefully as the game of flesh and blood grows which i think and know that it will uh hopefully i we can all kind of grow along with it and uh and and see more people come to the game so. and we already have to which is what's crazy yeah <laughs> considering like where i mean obviously i kind of met hayden throughout this process i think he's a part of that growth and kind of a mm. um you know, like a piece of it. Whereas like with me and you, we kind of, I mean, it's just, it feels like we started pretty similar in the sense that we, we both started at Reaper Game Store so long ago. And like to think of where we are now and just like how much this has changed our life. For me, it's like fundamentally yeah. changed my life. And I'm sure on yours and as well. Um, yeah. It's just incredible. And to think what, where that will be, right? Like give it two years, give it three years because we're still yeah. in the infancy of the game. That's right. And like, yeah, it's incredible. I want to ask you though, <laughs> In regards to commentating, is that is that something that you think you could see yourself doing again? Is it something you want to do again? Um, and uh, you know, we've got more callings coming. You know, all in the domestic U.S. or a lot of them are. Yeah. So, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I'd absolutely love to do it again. That was uh, one of the most life giving experiences I've uh, had uh, in my time on Earth. That was. Uh, I, I can't oversell it. I don't know. There's really no way for me to to oversell what that meant personally and like as a as a communal um, the experience of that. And so if I can provide commentary at any event, I would I would be glad to. And particularly at the callings, I would love to give commentary going forward. So, um, you know, I never say never in that sense, because I, uh, I would love to commentate. Uh, any and all future callings if they would like to have me. And as long as I don't like, you know, just absolutely word vomit at one of them, maybe they'll keep asking me to do them. Who knows? Do you, um, do you know what is happening for the rest of the year? Like, have you been, I'm not sure if you can, can say, can you tell us, but have you been approached for any more, I guess, coverage for the rest of the year? And we don't even know if there's going to be, I guess, coverage for the rest of the year um, with what's happening so far. Yeah, so I've, I was uh, talking to them and we're kind of working things out to make sure that everything is kind of squared away. But I'm hoping to provide calling uh, commentary in the future. So we'll see if and if everything lines up and, and works out, then uh, we may get to do it again. I may get to do it again um, yeah, yeah. at DFW. You know, Right here at home, right? Not yeah, so which is away. nice and easy. Nice You're in backyard. Easy. Yeah, yeah. And then, of mm -hmm. course, into next year, we've got the first lot of Pro Tours, World, uh, the Worlds. You know, I think we'd love, we'll love to see Dear Mamata behind the mic providing you know analysis and and some some commentary well i hope people i hope people would like that i mean yeah. i would like that um i i i hope that i do a good enough job that people are like yeah keep bringing that guy back you know um even if they don't know who i am or you know like that i have a youtube channel it doesn't really bother me if they don't um, it's, it's the idea that like random guy or girl on the internet looks at this and goes I understood something better, or I really enjoyed that moment when that would be uh, a good sign for me that I did something right, I guess. Yeah. So, here's there's, hoping. There's a, there's a game that you and Tannen were doing, and also, you know, shout out to, um, to Red Zone and to Tannen, who did, you know, a great job of, of the commentary as well. But there's a game that you and Tannen yeah, were doing, did. and I can't remember which round it was, but just the, you two were just getting each other excited by, like, the play that was happening uh, through the game, and it was just really cool to see. And I think a lot of people were like, that was like a moment for me, I think, where I was like, yeah, like this is happening. Like this is coverage for Flesh and Blood. Like we are starting to have, you know, proper things happen and, and you know, yourself mm. and Tan in that moment, like getting so into it. And you could just see like people in the comments, like in the on the chat, we're getting excited. I was sitting here being like, oh, this is like, this is exciting. Like this is cool. Like, there's a lot to take from this, which is was just awesome to see. They did a fantastic job. Both of them are amazing people first and foremost and that that speaks uh volumes but as far as commentary and just being able to support each other is concerned it was such a wonderful and, and not even just them too but they they did fantastic the uh the channel fireball crew the the people that ran the entire event as far as the coverage was concerned absolutely killing it i mean mm -hmm. like they were thinking on the fly i don't know if like I don't know if this is a faux pas to say, but literally round one starts and um, one of the commentary or not commentary, one of the computers that's recording the gameplay and then sending it to their hub, literally graphics card dies. That's like the table game on, starts, <laughs> graphic card dies, and they have to swap out into a laptop on the fly while we're providing commentary and they're getting feed from a different like literally in that moment, they're like running around trying to get everything working. And the fact that they 
pulled that off so successfully and all of the other things that uh, they did throughout that weekend, they, those guys killed it. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's pretty funny. I was, uh, I was actually on that table. So round one, it was Dante an opponent and me an opponent. Um, and I was on the table where the graphics card just kind of broke, <laughs> which is crazy. Um, I know that they, this might also kind of be a secret, um, but I, they were supposed to have like some sort of software that in, interacted with the combat chain. Um, mm -hmm. I think that it was, it didn't actually work in the end, but it sounded pretty cool. And I hope we get to see it for Dallas. Um, but anyway, yeah, me too. I, they, they said they were working it out and they were working on it. Um, they showed it to me a little bit and it, it functioned. It's just that it wasn't as clear as they would have liked. So as they work it out and, and kind of upgrade things and get it all squared away, I'm sure it's going to look even better, which is great. That's exactly what you want. I mean, that is you, you want people going, OK, how can we make this better from moment to moment, from round to round and then from tournament to, to tournament? So, yeah, I mm -hmm. think the, the amount of effort they've put into I, I've, I've seen a preview of what this this looks like. And it's it just is, I think, the fact that Channel 5 have gone and said we're going to make something that helps flesh and blood uh, audience the flesh and blood audience understand this better it's not probably not trans doesn't translate to any other card game to be honest but the fact they're putting the effort in just for flesh and blood i think is huge and um you know something like that hopefully we do see in the future just would you know be such a, a massive thing to have on on the coverage so fingers crossed yeah <laughs> yeah for sure well i had something right on the tip of my tongue and i seem to have I've ruined it totally it's no i got it i got it i got it <laughs> <laughs> so we actually had an article come out um, that went a bit, you know, talked a little bit. I think that was a new article about uh, the play. Anyway, I don't know if that, that was a recycled article that was pushed on social media, but basically it is like, it looks like it's 100% confirmed that rated ELO will count towards Pro Tour um, qualification. I just, I remember that because you mentioned the Pro Tour in 2022. It says, it literally says rated ELO um, to qualify. And then you can also um, get more PTIs or Pro Tour invites from playing the Pro Tour, which is expected. Um, but that's good to know that there will be qualifications based on ELO. So they did write that. I just want to touch on that before I, am, I want to ask you guys one final closing question, which is what do you think the Pro Tour looks like? Well, Steven, start with you. Just an easy question, right, Steven? He just goes, hey, let's have a really easy question to close. What does the Pro Tour look like? Well, let me t paint you a picture. Everyone close your eyes. I mean, pause for a moment while I collect myself. Uh, what does the Pro Tour look like? In what respect? Like, so, as far as attendance, yeah. um, as far as, like, w oh, yeah, what's, what's yeah, the... So, like, are we looking at, are we looking at, you know, like, what is the what is the kind of event structure like in terms of, like, a calendar, right? Like, are we doing events kind of every month? Like, how many people are going? Like, what? or just give me, like, the most broad aspect of, like, what you think the Pro Tour looks like. Because right now I have no idea right i didn't i didn't follow magic pro tour closely i just don't know what to expect um and because i have a pti i'm definitely com i've committed my 2022 at least spiritually um to competing in that i just want to get your thoughts on like what could that potentially look like are we just looking at you know what maybe you know callings but they're invite only or what do you expect um, I, I don't know I, I will say this i think it'll be somewhere a little less than calling level type events i'm totally i'm kind of in your boat as well because i never followed pro tour magic the gathering myself but just thinking about it and when i was making some videos about the idea of a pro tour and about like their tournament structure i would imagine it that would be like slightly more splintered smaller but highly competitive tournaments that are scattered around that you can kind of travel like a circuit in a way um i, I don't know they're frequency or like distance or amount of time between them uh but i will say this i do expect it to be successful um mm -hmm. and i do also expect the 2022 pro tour and general tournaments within 2022 to be sort of the defining moment of flesh and blood a exactly. lot of people have said um the calling las vegas was going to be the the defining moment or there's people that say like the calling that's going to be in orlando national championship <laughs> Uh, is going to be sort of like the defining moment. I I respect those opinions, but I don't think that's necessarily the case because I think those events could fall, fall on their face. And yet because uh, Legend Story Studios committed the amount of money and the amount of like publicity and time and dedication to the Pro Tour in 2022, I, th I think that to, it is the linchpin of Flesh and Blood. 
um, and sort of the, that big defining moment that people are going to look back on. Um, and I do think it will be successful. Yeah, I'm very excited for it, and I'm ready to kind of give it my all for 2022. I do want to, I do want to caveat though, because anytime I quote Flesh and Blood news, and I think I saw Hayden type on his computer to pull it up and try to find it, I always misquote. I always say just absolutely, <laughs> like just it's terrible. So maybe, maybe rated E level that you qualify, but I swear I picked up my phone and I read that like six times over so that I could say it tonight. But like I saw a, Hayden typing and I knew he didn't believe me. I'm like a fact check. I feel like I have to fact check Brendan. I, I feel like I have seen it as well. I couldn't find anything with a quick search, but I'm a, I just want to lay it on you real quick because this is something that I have thought about this question here, right here, Brendan, about the pro tour because I was someone who was pretty pretty invested, I would say, in the, uh, I guess, the coverage that was presented for Magic when they did their pro tour circuits, uh, when they had you know, organized play at a professional level. And one of the things that I think makes those so unique is it's like, it is a marquee event of a season. So you think about a set releases, like we have Tales of Aria releases right now, we're about to head into a limited season and then into the Nationals constructed season, right? That is a season of the set. So at the moment, we're looking at three sets a year, right? To, to me, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to be seeing probably three pro tours and a Worlds, and those are going to be the marquee events of those season. Uh, those seasons and that's where players around the world are going to look to go like where does my inspiration come for my deck building what is the meta being the meta traditionally in, in tcgs gets shaped by these pro level events right and that's what the pro tour should be it should be uh it should be heavily covered and i guess this is just what i want to say I guess it should be heavily covered it should be uh generally a three-day you know event a friday to sunday uh with the top eight on the sunday um across and not just coverage of games, but coverage of players. I think that's the next step we come to in, in Flesh and Blood, right, is that we've had coverage of, of the games, which is fantastic, and now it's time as we start to get to know players in Flesh and Blood and um, players who are doing well, who are actively going to be on this Pro Tour circuit, what do, who are they? Let's let's um, let's yep. learn more about them. Let's hear the interviews with them during the Pro Tour breaks, you know, between match breaks. Let's see the deck text. Let's see, like, that's the next stage that comes, I think, when you get to a Pro Tour, because calling should be about the the set the cards and the games and then i think the pro tour should be about the people and uh and the season that we live in so that's kind of what i see for for the upcoming i guess 2022 and whether that pans out uh, we'll we'll see but that's my my sort of pipe dream so do you think they're going to tie um every pro tour to a calling or do you think that the callings will be at separate events or that they're going to tie some pro tours to the calling and have some standalones what are you thinking there I think they need to make the the most of uh, the the schedule, right? So if you've got players yeah. who are going to actively travel to play in pro tour events, you want to incentivize that travel, right? So you want to have probably a calling either either side of that weekend, so the weekend before and the weekend after, probably in close proximity. So say you had a mm -hmm. pro tour that ends up being in Europe, and it, maybe it's in London, for instance. Uh, do you try and put a calling the weekend before and I don't know Manchester, and then the one the weekend after in the Netherlands, for instance. Like, is that how you kind of structure? That's probably what I see. As in terms of, do they put a calling on the weekend of the actual Pro Tour itself? Maybe that is that's like a big logistical challenge, right? That's a lot of like manpower to do that because you've got to run a Pro Tour and you've got to run a, a calling at the same time. And if you're trying to do maybe coverage for both, or you're trying to wrap it into right. one, uh, that's a very difficult thing to do potentially. Well, we may we may get some answers because they are going to run a calling and a national championship in Orlando, and so we may see how they how they tackle that and what their plan is uh, going forward as far as like coverage and um, you know size of the venue and event that sort of stuff. It might be interesting to see how they plan to tackle it. I mean, we did see a pro quest, but a pro quest is not nearly to the Very same easy. degree. Yeah. Right? It's like a yeah. day two opt out, right? If you yeah. don't, if you can't you know, can't compete or if you don't make day two, the calling in Orlando is fascinating. So it's in the United States. We're obviously in the middle of COVID still. So not a lot of people are physically able to travel. So we're hosting the United States national championship on the same weekend. So I, I have no clue what that calling will look like. And I, mm -hmm. that's good. Like that's, that's really interesting. Cause I know there's Canadians that are coming down to play that event and for yeah. canadians that's got to be like christmas day right they're like oh my god there's a calling and then there's national championships on the same side but like what does that calling look like because i know that i think that if hayden like i think hayden might talk to it. if he could travel to it he probably would like it's a very good calling to go to right yeah, I mean, I, pro I probably would. I mean, basically any event that happens right now that's at a, a higher level is like the highest 
level of flesh and blood mm. we have right like at one point six seven months ago skirmish was like the premier level of flesh and blood because we just didn't have anything else so a calling yep. comes that's the premier level nationals comes that's the premier level until we get to pro tours next yep. year and we get into a regular cycle but yeah i mean look uh, i've been itching to to go and, and play some more flesh and blood overseas and whether that happens this year probably unlikely at this stage but you know i think people would travel for it it's just um like you say you it's you'd probably i would say like if you have a calling in a, in a um in a country, you probably say like it's going to be eighty to ninety percent domestic, if not ninety five percent domestic. But you are going to get people who travel for it, and if it's in a, a pro- close proximity, so like the the Dutch um, calling that's coming up, like that's probably going to be like sixty percent. Uh, you know, I would say domestic because they're so close in proximity to a lot of other yeah. European countries. So it just it just depends, I think. But I think specifically for Orlando, yeah, I mean, I can't see anyone else outside of maybe Canada and maybe central america if there's a player based starting to develop there that can actually travel for it we'll see yeah, i agree with that <laughs> yeah fascinating it's uh you're getting me all you're getting me all hot and bothered talking about this pro tour and like Dude. traveling to uh traveling to i mean that's just it's the scope of it really hasn't set in so the idea of kind of you know doing three weeks in europe to do this little you know this little circuit of callings and a pro tour and then you know maybe do the same thing in asia and uh, yep. new zealand australia i mean the scope of that is just very hard to appreciate right now that's a that's going to be quite a difference uh, a different pace of life right yeah. yeah and that's kind of what they're shooting for isn't it i mean that's literally what they want to create is this idea of a constantly rotating circuit that you can travel if you choose and of course you can take legs off and you know take your time wherever you need it but if you're choosing to kind of pursue that there is a you know a possibility that you can turn that into some sort of you know a living and that's i think that's what they're aiming for and like i said i do think it is going to be successful yeah yeah i just wanted to say like lastly i think for me and i don't want to bang on about i guess magic again but like the pro tour circuit from seven eight years ago six seven years ago like that to me i think is like the pinnacle of trading card game professional events and how you run a circuit uh, i think they did an amazing job and and look that's that ceased and i guess um, lss have regularly pounced on the opportunity to capitalize on that and say well you know what flesh and blood is going to be the premier i guess um competitive level paper tcg so yeah, I mean, we could see something very, very similar, if not better. You know, Alexis have uh, had a pretty good commitment to, I guess, um, looking after players, communities, stores. Um, so we, we'll see. Yeah, they, they're they really good at looking after just about everybody that they deal with. And yeah, I heard a lot of stories from a lot of different people um, as far as involved in the, the calling Las Vegas. And so if, if they keep doing that, it's one of the reasons why they will be successful because they, they have a heart for who they're working for. So good on them. 100%. Awesome. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. It was great getting to know you on stream uh, or on the YouTube. Sorry, I've obviously we've we've met before and we've kind of been friends here for a solid year, but always good to hear your thoughts on, you know, what's going on in your mind and flesh and blood, what your hopes are for the future and all the good stuff in between. But before we head out, can you go ahead and shoot out all your socials and, you know, your YouTube and your podcasts and uh, your Twitter, all that good stuff? Sure. I, uh, I do stuff. I make videos and things on youtube.com slash DM Armada. Um, I have a Twitter. It's Armada DM at Armada DM. Uh, and uh, I do have like Instagram and that sort of stuff. You can find it's DM Armada just about everywhere. So it's pretty easy. Pretty easy to find that stuff. I'm a, I'm a Luddite when it comes to social media. So I try to make it easy on myself. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, that's that's if you want to come hang out with me, feel free. YouTube.com slash DM Armada. We'll do stuff. It'll be great. You join the join the uh, the ranks of the, the Welcome to Wraith Boomers, Stephen. But I will drop all your links down in the description so that uh, people can go and find you. But you're at six thousand subscribers. Congratulations! Just want to say before we wrap up. So thank I think you. Most yeah. people are finding you. So awesome stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, thanks again. We hope you all enjoyed this episode, and we will see you next week.